You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, I'm just I'm just going to say it, man. Um, I think we kind of spanked the Rams a little bit. I know the score didn't really indicate that. I know it was kind of down to the wire, if you can really call 11 points with, you know, under a minute left, close. <laughs> but really, I mean, the... The Rams had two really big plays, which the Packers have not given up a ton of those. They had, so they had two really good plays, um, and there were some special teams gaffes that gave them some short fields. Maybe one, I don't know. And that's not to say, like in other games where there was literally no other good plays, I mean, they were able to move the ball occasionally, but for the most part, we shot them down entirely. They could not run the ball. They could not throw the ball. That was the story of the game. And offensively, I thought this was... One of the better, more complete first through fourth quarter games I've seen. I thought Aaron Rodgers looked incredible. Um, As the game wore on, there were a couple passes that didn't seem perfect. But I think with every single one of those, there was pressure right in Rodgers' face. The pressure really started to get home a lot. Not to mention his injury was really starting to bug him. You could see him limping around quite a bit. But even so, um, those passes from Aaron Rodgers were unbelievable. They were crisp. They were right on target. I mean, some. I mean, a lot of these wide receivers were blanketed. Some of those throws to Devontae, there's nowhere to go. I mean, there's such high-risk throws that if you would have just paused it and said, do you think he should throw it? Like, if, if we could pause it and Rodgers, like, reaches out to me through the TV and is like, hey, man, I think I can make this throw. What do you think? I'd have been like, you absolutely not. Just take a sack or something. Don't ever throw that. And he just threw some of the most pinpoint passes especially with Devontae. That was just so in sync. I'm really sad that that triple coverage <laughs> third down conversion ended up getting dropped by Devontae, which is a, really no fault of Devontae. That, that was just insane. But I really hoped he was able to hold on to that because that was going to be one of the more remarkable throw and catches I've seen this season. But um, no, I, I really thought it was good. I mean, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't the most clean we've seen. We had another missed field goal, which you know brought us from 39 down to 36. Again, we had Randall Cobb setting them up in short field with a, a muffed punt. And then, you know, the two big plays where it really just was Razul didn't quite have the juice to keep up, and the safeties seemingly were just over-aggressive. I mean, it was just a good play call by the Rams. It was designed that way. They baited up the safeties. That was the intention, to get the safeties to bite. And as soon as the safeties bit, he threw up a Hail Mary. And basically, the only two good throws of Matt Stafford all day were those bombs down the field. So I'm not even super mad at Razul Douglas. These are playing, even on that first one, he's looking around with his hands up like, dude, where was my safety help on that one? Because usually the Packers end up getting a pick on that. That's one where Amos or Savage is flying in. And when there's no safety help, something's wrong. So I'm not excusing it. It's, it's something that you can't let happen. It's something that has now been put on tape that we need to watch out for and be careful for. Um, but what I am saying is overall, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed and proud of the performance of this team. Um, from top to bottom, I really just thought it was a great performance. And we, we even got, um, as disappointing as special teams was, we even got help from special teams, including a turnover on special teams, some great punts on special teams, some really good coverage, some really bad coverage, but some really good coverage on special teams. Speaking of, can we never use that stupid flying around camera like ever? I mean, I don't mind it when they're like in the huddle and we're just kind of zooming around with that thing. I know you spent a bunch of money and you need to justify it, but I'm so, I can't, I have no ability to gauge how many yards they picked up when they're using that camera, and I don't know why. Every time they're using it, I see the guy run. It looks like he got about five yards. We tackled him, and I'm celebrating, and he's at the 40-yard line. It's like, wait a minute. It's stupid, and I hate it. But again, just running through the depth chart real quick. Not everybody was great, but um, start off with Aaron Rodgers again. This is one of the cleanest games. I don't know what his grade's going to be, but just I just thought it was super clean. I I really did. I, I thought those passes were just tight and on target and the decisions were there and they were crisp and um, he just looked he looked on point Aaron Jones looked quick but I I just feel like Aaron Jones at this particular point in time um, just doesn't really serve a great purpose and I'm glad they pulled him I'm hoping he's not injured I, I really think it came down to he's playing hurt 
and he's not given us the production that A.J. Dillon is. Let's just not risk it and pull him to the side. And I think that was the right decision because Aaron Jones is a great football player. But part of the issue is when you're playing really physical teams, but also when you have an offensive line that's not really good at blocking, he just doesn't really serve much of a purpose. You can, you can say he does as a receiver, but I think A.J. Dillon is, is about on point with where Aaron Jones is right now. Maybe not some of the downfield route running stuff, but any of the throws behind the line of scrimmage, A.J. Dillon does as good, if not better. And so really the only run game that we had was just blasting into a pile of guys and pushing that pile. And Aaron Jones just couldn't handle that. I mean, there was nowhere for him to go. He met somebody and he just got brought down right away. Again, not mad at Aaron Jones. He's a very talented running back. But um, until we can get an offensive line that can block, he just doesn't really serve a purpose right now. And I don't want to hurt Aaron Jones to come in just to be a third down, you know, receiving or blocking back. I just, I don't, we don't need that. On that note, A.J. Dillon loved it. Statistics didn't look great, but duh. Again, there was no blocking. There just was no run blocking whatsoever. But you can see a stark contrast. Again, think of Aaron Jones as um, a good NFL running back. In other words, take Dalvin Cook, Aaron Jones, any of those kind of top tier, call it 5'11", 210 pound running backs or whatever, throw them behind our offensive line. That's about what they're going to get. 10 carries, 23 yards, 2.3 average, right? There's just, there's just nothing there. A.J. Dillon is a difference maker. The fact that he squeezed 3.4 yards per carry out of that and, and kudos to the Packers for grinding that. There's nowhere to go. We still gave him 20 carries and just grinding away at that. And look, th- this, this is a tough game if, if these things aren't on point. If we don't have A.J. Dillon and we don't have Aaron Rodgers throwing some really, really pinpoint passes, we don't score anywhere near the amount of points we did. They had to fight real hard for every yard that they got. And the fact that they were able to sustain such long drives meant they were able to do it consistently. Because there wasn't a lot of room for these wide receivers to work. There was not a lot of time in the pocket, and there was no run blocking. But they still found a way to grind their way down the field, and that's also a, a massive props to our offensive coordinator and head coach to mix up the play calling and just make it work. Come up with that next right play. Um, offensive line, I know I'm kind of talking trash, but I'm, I'm not mad about it. We went over their players. We went over how premier they are. Von Miller, it wasn't until, what, the third or fourth quarter when he had a when he had a play behind the line of scrimmage and it was a run play and they said that was the first time they'd said his name all day, that's impressive. It wasn't perfect, but my goodness, Von Miller and Aaron Donald are side by side. And again, they've got a bunch of guys that can get to the quarterback on this team. And uh, yeah, if he held the ball for three seconds, or probably he's probably going to be on his back. But the fact that they gave him the time that he needed, they gave him the space he needed, it's just, it's just a good job. Again, do I expect better? Well, yeah. Is, as far as run blocking especially, it needs to get better because this is not a premier run blocking or run defense team. But the biggest, most important thing by far is to keep your quarterback clean. And this is a tough team to do that against no matter what. And we're dealing with, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, this is not even hyperbole. Billy Turner might be our best offensive lineman. Last year, our worst offensive lineman is this year's best offensive lineman. That really says something. Yash Nyman, John Runyon, Lucas Patrick, and Royce Newman. Are you kidding me? We'll see what PFF has to say. Maybe uh, Royce turned a corner. He's had a couple good weeks and whatnot. And, and Yash seems to do a pretty good job. But I mean, this, this, is, this is patchwork. Our entire offensive line is different. The, the offensive line we had last year, new left tackle, new left, well, kind of new left guard, new center, new right guard. Not one of them is an upgrade. Not one. How many sacks did Aaron Donald have in this game? The entire defense had one sack, and it was Greg Gaines. So was it a great game? Are they going to grade out super well? Probably not. Am I happy with the performance? Yes. If I thought this was our long-term starting offensive line, would I be nervous? Yes, I would. Um, Either way, we're probably going to have to do some work. We know Elton's going to be out until probably late in the season starting next year. So if I'm looking at the draft, we've got a lot of work to do. I I really, even before Elton got hurt, I felt like that was our number one priority in the draft. I think that is, you know, A1A right now. Beachfront Avenue. Right? A1A Beachfront. Okay, never mind. I mean, just just that fact alone, zero sacks is, is crazy. 
And as far as tight ends, um, I mean, it, it, they haven't played a major role outside of blocking, and I haven't really observed the blocking all that much. I thought uh, Mercedes Lewis didn't have his best game ever. Um, the one thing you kind of rely on is him just being a truck, and it seems like recently he just kind of goes down on first contact, not able, you know, guys are doing a good job of just grabbing his knees. But also that fumble, um, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but I saw that fumble coming a mile away. He was flinging that football around, holding it with one hand. I mean, that thing was coming out no matter what. Um, DeGuara, though, I thought had another good game. Not perfect. He's coming along maybe a little bit slower than a lot of us would like, but he's starting to, probably out of necessity, but it's not a bad thing, he's starting to grow in this offense. And seeing Rodgers start to trust him more, that big third down conversion, that's critical stuff, and it's really, really nice to see. Wide receivers, obviously, Devontae had a great day. Um, MVS kind of did what MVS does. He gets those couple of couple of plays, not real big throws, but he had his couple catches. Randall, I mean, obviously he had the muff punt, but what a great day he had. I swear that guy runs a 4-2-4. That, was, that guy, when he took off running, I, I swear I've not seen somebody run that fast in a long time. Um, Equinemius had one nice catch that I can recall. Alan Lazard still struggling. Still have not seen Alan Lazard kind of get into the rhythm. Have not seen him uh, be the guy we need him to be. He had one really critical throw. I think it was a, a drop touchdown reception right in his hands. Not saying it's the easiest thing in the world, but the, the, those are the kinds of catches that made Alan Lazard Alan Lazard. Tough, contested, contest, uh, contested catches. You know, I mean, he's a big dude with strong hands. And it looks like it went through his hands and hit him in the face. I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff we need him for, and he just has not risen to that occasion. Um, defensively, it looked like Kenny was a monster in this game. Second week in a row, I just watched him walk center straight back. Off the top of my head, I recall a sack and one big tackle for a loss on the running back. Pass rushers, um, statistically, I don't know what all Preston did, but I saw several pressures. Rashawn Gary with a critical strip on Matt Stafford. I don't really know how many pressures he got. Maybe it wasn't as many as, as we would like. And I know he was he was not on the field all that much. So we'll have to take a look at his his numbers. But um, I stand by what I said. I think these games are won and lost based on guys like Rashawn Gary. I think we lost last week because we didn't have him. And you look at what he did in this game. How critical was that play? And there were several other times when there was pressure right in Matt Stafford's face. And that either caused an errant pass or a pick or uh, throw away. Those pressures matter tremendously. As far as linebackers, the one guy that stood out to me was Chris Barnes. Um, the guy was just flying all over the field. I saw him breaking up passes. I saw him making tackles. He was everywhere. Holding it down a corner, Eric Stokes and Razul Douglas. I mean, another area we're just completely decimated. But man, if we assume that those two big plays, and I even could be run that first one, wasn't that first one Chandon Sullivan? I think it was. I think I'm mistaken. I think that first big play was Chand and the second one was was Razul. But if we assume that that big play wasn't just Razul's fault, it was because Amos kind of bid on something. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a reason why this guy had a historically good day at corner. But oh my goodness, was he solid in this game. Eric Stokes looked like Eric Stokes. He, you didn't really hear his name because he just does a great job on a play-to-play basis and does stuff that he doesn't get a lot of credit for, just generally locking guys down. And then there's a couple plays where it gets thrown at him. Of course, it's a a 50-50 ball because Stokes is always in the guy's hip pocket, and he always does a terrible job guarding (laughs) in those situations. Um, I think he got lucky twice. The one play should have been a touchdown. He wouldn't turn his head around, but he stepped out of bounds. Um, And the second play was just a bad throw. There was also a third time I know he was thrown at where I was shocked they didn't throw a flag, but kudos to the refs for uh, keeping the flags in their pockets. There were some really questionable calls and non-calls in this game. The Aaron Donald thing in particular infuriated me, but I think for the most part, generally they were pretty consistent in just not throwing flags, and that, those are always my favorite refs. I'll you know throw a little fit about a couple things here and there, but if your crew just does not throw flags and you're consistent with that, you let them get away with stuff, but then you let us get away with stuff. You know, our defense gets off the field when our corner's getting a little bit more handsy and, you know, the, the wide receiver's furious and looking at the ref and he's like, nah, maybe just be a man and catch the ball. How about that? Respect. <laughs> but again, I, on a play, and this, this is another third down, it was a play in which we got a hold, uh, a penalty for holding, and Aaron Donald is grabbing, I think it was Lucas Patrick's throat, 
squeezing it. I mean, I mean, it, it was like I've seen that on martial arts things, right? Like one of those self defense um, courses where they they talk about like just grabbing the trachea and just squeezing like with your fingers. That's what he was doing to our center. And it's not like, well, maybe the ref didn't see it. The ref was there. The ref extracted his hand off of his throat and then saw a flag over there. And while they're huddled together talking about a penalty, he doesn't feel the need to bring up, oh, by the way, we should probably be, probably mention Aaron uh, Donald over there was squeezing the throat of the center. So um, maybe offsetting, replay, no? All right, I'll, I'll, we'll just not bring it up. That one bothered me a little bit. But otherwise, if it's a bunch of just non-call pass interference stuff, I mean, whatever. And by the way, kudos to our guys. If you're playing those kinds of crews and uh, they're just letting guys get away with stuff, I expect you to start grabbing. I expect some serious hand fighting, some arm bars, and um, I mean, just just do it. If they're going to let you get away with it, you're stupid for not doing it. Um, but yeah, j- in general, the corners, I thought, did a great job. Razul with a pick six. He almost had two pick sixes. Stokes almost had a pick six. I mean, I don't know for sure they would have been pick sixes. I think Stokes would have been for sure. Not positive about Razul on that next one, but um, fantastic job. And Chandon, again, the one time we heard his name, it was a big play and a bad play, and that that generally is going to make us think he just had a terrible day. But the fact that he didn't hear his name all day outside of that, solid. And then the safeties, I mean, Savage, you didn't really hear his name, so I don't know that he did a terrible job. And... Um, Amos is just always doing a great job. That fourth down stop is so... The fact that he's such a good safety, he's such a good free safety, and is such a good tackler out in space, but also is one of our best short yardage weapons, is un- the amount of times... I wish somebody could go back and tell me how many times he came up on clutch, goal line, third down, fourth down stops. He's got to be one of our best producers in that area. It's incredible. He just took the guy's leg. There was, I mean, it, 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 it's not even like he was one of three guys that got it in on a, on a stop. When you got one-on-one and a running back coming full steam at a safety, the odds that that safety is going to stop you from gaining seven inches is almost zero. He took his legs out. And, and, and that's the other thing. You could take a guy's legs out and he still is going to fall forward. You took his legs out with such violence that he just spun like with his is his hips on an axis <laughs> where he did not go forward his legs went up as his body went down at the same exact speed he spun in place and his arms went down for no gain that's remarkable um and then again special teams is special teams Bohorquez had a great day and Crosby did not that's just what it is and again you you can blame not Crosby if you want to blame not Crosby i, I you know if you can get a special teams coach to come on here and explain to me or just tell me flat out this is not Crosby's fault, it's 100% somebody else's, but I have not seen a bad snap or a bad hold in a long time. And he continues to miss. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I know we love Crosby. I love Crosby. It's got to be a little bit Crosby's fault at this point. Anyways, um, why don't we go ahead and take a break right Shia? Come back and just keep doing what we're doing, man. Just keep having a good time. Keep throwing a little bit of a party. If by chance you want to support the podcast, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Any and all support is greatly, wildly appreciated. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from. 
including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So um, before we kind of get into some of the statistics and stuff, I want to talk about some of the games that happened. Most notably, the Vikings lost to the 49ers, which is absolutely fantastic news. Um, To make matters even um, better, I guess, I'm watching on loop, as I'm talking to you, a play in which Kirk Cousins ran out onto the field, lined up under his guard to try to run a play, and... um, and then, you know, had to call a timeout. <laughs> <coughs> it's funny, too, because if you look at the comments, all the Vikings fans are saying, this was a trick. They tried to get him to jump off sides, obviously. You know, he lined up under the guard so that, you know, everybody, there would just be chaos. They're trying to they're just trying to create chaos. Look at the defense. They're just standing there like, what is this idiot doing right now? Not to mention, the running back had to run up and grab Kirk and try to move him to center. The right tackle, the entire play. The entire play, if they're trying to sell this as like a trick where it's just chaotic, the whole time the right tackle is pushing him going, dude, hey, wrong spot, dummy. Hey, you got to move over. And there were two seconds left. And as soon as he hears from his right tackle, he looks up and quick throws a timeout sign. His wide receiver, by the way, is all the way on the end, flailing his arms like, what the heck is going on here? But again, the idea is, well, they were just trying to, to draw, you know, it was just meant to be confusion to get him to jump. Why would they jump? The defense doesn't even have their hand in the dirt. One of the guys is just clapping. He's just standing there staring at Kirk Cousins clapping. Just hilariously. Nobody's even lined up. How are they going to jump? They're standing there watching just this clown show. I I might have to go back and watch this game. This looks like a really good game. <laughs> oh, he lined up under his guard. That's awesome. Can you imagine the emotions that that guard was going through when Kirk Cousins walked up and, like, smacked his butt. I mean, he's, like, he's like grabbing his hips, man. <laughs> it's, it's an awkward moment when you're a guard. Like, if that's your center, it's like, hey, this is, I get paid for this. And the guard didn't flinch. That's, that's the funny part. He just is sitting there like, what is, what is happening? You know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm envisioning him whispering to the tackle, like, dude, help. First of all, who's doing this to me? <laughs> I can't stop watching this. He literally walks up. It must be like a that must be like a thing you do to like let the guy know you're there. He walks up and just gives him a firm spanking. <laughs> oh, I might just do the rest of the podcast describing this video to you because I don't ever want to stop watching this. <laughs> this is the awkwardness in the locker room. I just I just picture Kirk Cousins walking up to him and being like, hey, man, you want to talk about it? And he's like, no, get away from me. Get away from me. Like, just can't make eye contact with him, you know? Like, he's just looking dead ahead, looking at a stone-cold killer on the San Francisco 49ers defense, getting ready to just rip somebody's head off, just violently attack somebody. And your quarterback walks up and just starts spanking you. He's going to need therapy. And you got to have the right tackle try to, like, push the quarterback off of you as you just just sit there. The running back's trying to pull him off of you. He probably wants to file a police report, but he's just so ashamed, you know? I hope if that guy's not married, you know, if the guy's married, it doesn't kind of strain that relationship. All right, all right, I'll, I'll stop now. That is funny, though. All right, let's take a look at some of the uh, statistics and recap type stuff. Aaron Rodgers was 28 of 45, 307 yards, 6.8 yards per attempt, two touchdowns, no interceptions, 54 yards was the longest, only one sack in the game, 97.2 passer rating. Kind of talked about running backs already, but uh, A.J. Dillon, 20 for 69, 3.4 yard average, 
Aaron Jones, 10 carries, 23 yards, 2.3 yard average. Both of them had eight yards as their longest. Odell Beckham apparently was targeted 10 times in this game. That's kind of crazy to me. But uh, 10 targets, five receptions, 81 yards. Uh, obviously, the 54 yarder had a lot to do with that, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of shocked by that. Same with Cooper Cup. 10 targets, 7 receptions, 96 yards. Um, I guess I just kind of blacked out for <laughs> for some of that. They did throw the ball a lot, I guess. Uh, Van Jefferson, 9. I mean, just just ten, 9 and 10 targets is a lot of targets for any wide receiver. I mean, Devontae had 9 in this game. Um, that might be somewhat normal for a guy like Devontae, but even for Devontae, that's... I mean, if Devontae had like 7 targets, 5 receptions, that's pretty standard. For three guys to have nine and ten targets is pretty wild. But Van Jefferson, nine targets, only three receptions. Did have 93 yards. Obviously, the 79-yarder had a big part in that. But uh, for the Packers, Devontae, nine targets, eight receptions, 104 yards. You talk about being in sync. I mean, nine targets is one thing, but to complete eight of them for 104 yards, 43 yards was the longest. I mean, those guys were just on track. A.J. Dillon, five targets, five receptions, 21 yards. I haven't seen A.J. Dillon drop a pass ever. Also added a touchdown. Randall Cobb, five targets, four receptions, 95 yards. MVS, nine targets, four receptions. That's kind of standard for them. They just have a real hard time connecting. Plus, usually the difficulty level is quite a bit harder for MVS passes, but uh, still not where you want it to be, uh, especially when it's just 50 yards. I mean, if you're going to be the nine or even six targets, two reception guy, fine, but give me a 50-yarder in there. Al Lazard, six targets, two receptions, 13 yards. Again, not a great day. Josiah, four targets, two receptions, 13 yards. Mercedes, three targets, two receptions, four yards. Aaron Jones, one target, zero receptions. Equinemius, two targets, one reception, seven yards. Defensively, again, for the Rams, I mentioned Greg Gaines, the only guy with a sack in this in this game. Uh, three guys with a tackle for a loss, Ashawn Robinson, Von Miller, and Troy Reeder. Even that's not that bad considering how poorly the offensive line did run blocking. Um, they had a uh, forced fumble by Ogbonia Okoronkwo, as well as Ro- uh, Rob Havenstein. Isn't that their tackle, or am I mistaken? <laughs> Anyways, for the Packers, looking at tackles, uh, Chris Barnes led the team in tackles. Again, he was flying around like crazy, had a great day. Rizul Douglas was actually tied with Kenny Clark for the number two spot. Um, Sacks in the game, Rashawn Gary and Kenny Clark each had one. Tackles for a loss, Kenny Clark was the only guy with a tackle for a loss. Forced fumble, you had Mr. Rashawn Gary as well as Dominique Daphne. the heck was that? I don't know. Uh, Razul Douglas with the pick for 33 yards and a touchdown. Um, Pass deflections. Razul Douglas with four pass deflections in this game. That is a remarkably high number. I mean, if I just go week by week, week one... In 2021, um, the most pass deflections was two. In week two, the most pass deflections in a game was two. In week three, the most pass deflections in a game was two. Week four, the most pass deflections was three. Two guys had three. Week five, you had a guy that was a freak, Mr. Marshawn Lattimore, with six pass breakups, but the second highest was two. Um, week six, one guy, JC Jackson had four pass breakups. The next highest was two. Emmanuel Mosley in week seven had four, only one guy. So, so far there has been one with more, two that have tied that. So three total, four or more through seven weeks. Week eight, only three. One guy had three. Uh, week nine, three, week 10, three, week 11, two. So far in week 12, one. So if those numbers stay... And he does have four pass breakups in this game, plus a pick six in this game. Um, I don't know that that wasn't statistically one of the best defensive performances by a cornerback all season. Pretty wild. Anyways, uh, in addition to that, Chris Barnes had a pass breakup. Preston Smith had a pass breakup. And Eric Stokes had two pass breakups, which if it wasn't for Razul Douglas, you'd look at and go, dude, that's pretty solid, man. Two pass breakups, half the season at least, two pass breakups is going to lead the league. But that is a grand total of eight pass breakups. That's crazy. And uh, Corey Bajorquez, five punts, 212 yards, 42.4 average. Three of those punts were inside the 20, and his longest of the day was 61 yards. That's a boomerang, man. That's a boomerang. Johnny Hecker, the guy that they hung on to, 41 average, 53 was a long, one of five inside the 20. 
Sucks to suck, I guess. Some of the team statistics, time of possession, the Packers won basically 40 to 20. 39-40 to 20-20. Offensive plays, the Packers ran 78, the Rams ran 61. Uh, we had more offensive yards, 399 to 353. Yards per play, they actually beat us, but it doesn't matter when you have less plays. Penalties, four for them, three for us. Again, not that I was super stoked with the officiating, but uh, seven total penalties. I think Dallas had seven penalties on one drive. Penalty yards, 30 compared to 32. That's really low, and I'm okay with that. Uh, Packers with four touchdowns, Rams with three. Field goals, Packers were three of four, Rams were two of two. Uh, two Two-point conversions, Packers were 0 for two. Says the Rams were one for two. When did we go for a second one? When did they go for a second one? I was just going to say we have not stopped a two-point conversion attempt like ever. And according, I don't know, I'm not buying it. I think they were one for one. I think you're all liars. Turnovers, Rams with three, Packers with one. Fumbles lost, Rams two, Packers one. What else is interesting here? Sacks two to one. Sack percentage, uh, Matt Stafford was sacked 4.9% of his dropbacks. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, only 2.2%. Again, they have the better pass rushers and the better offensive line. Two to one. Remarkable. And our offense was on the field more. <laughs> they had more opportunities than we did. First downs, we had 21. They had 15. Third downs, uh, let's see, we were 7 of 19, which is 37%. They were 4 of 13, which is 31%. We weren't super high, but 31% for them, only 4 of 13. That's pretty crazy. Uh, Fourth downs, we were 2 for 2, 100%. They were uh, 0 for 1. So that would be, let me do some quick math here, uh, 0%. Red zone, we were 3 of 5. I wasn't super stoked about the red zone, but I guess I'll take 60%. They were 1 of 2, 50%. So again, we win. Passes defensed, again, we had 8. They had 4. I just realized as I switch over to NFL.com, I said I was going to talk about those other games, and I... Didn't because I got hung up on uh, <laughs> Kirk Cousins under uh, over his guard. But uh, yeah, Vikings lost, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, I want to look at some of these insights because these are always fun. Matthew Stafford and Aaron Rodgers have, have combined for 8,867 passing yards in their 17 career matchups, the third most by opposing starting quarterbacks since 1950. That's kind of cool. I wonder if uh, Brett Favre has has one. Who, but who would be the other guy? That's the question. It would have to be a bear, which, give me a break, a Viking or a lion. So, probably not. Pretty interesting tip. That would have been more interesting before the game than after. But apparently, Matt Stafford is 0-17 when he plays a team that is five games ahead of 500. That's crazy. Aaron Rodgers is 3-14 versus Stafford in his career, the third best win percentage by one starting quarterback over an opposing starting quarterback since 1950, minimum of 15 matchups. Aaron Rodgers is 6-1 in his career versus the Rams, including the playoffs, 4-0 at home. The Packers are 9-0 in games with one or more takeaways this season. That's crazy. Aaron Rodgers has 300-plus passing yards, two-plus passing touchdowns, and one or more rushing touchdowns. For the ninth time in his career, only Tom Brady has more such games since 1950, and that number is 11, so you can catch that. Devontae Adams has 100-plus receiving yards for the 28th time in his career. Only Hall of Famer James Lofton and Sterling Sharp have more such games among Green Bay players since 1950. Aaron Rodgers has 300-plus passing yards for the 68th time in his career, Next closest Green Bay quarterback since 1950 is Hall of Famer Brett Favre with 55 games. That's not even close at all. Wow. And you would think the gunslinger, especially a guy that's played so many games, would have a lot more than that, but I guess not. Aaron Rodgers has two or more passing touchdowns for the 136th time in his career. Only Hall of Famer Brett Favre, 141, has more such games among Green Bay quarterbacks since 1950. Aaron Rodgers has 20-plus fantasy points for the 111th time in his career, third most such game since 1950. For the, for the record, the significance of 1950 is because that's when a lot of these, that's as far as their tracking goes. That's why they keep saying since 1950, because it's not definitive. It's the most that, they're, that they know of. Randall Cobb had 95 receiving yards in the first half, his most in a first half since week 11, 2014, when he had 97 yards versus Philadelphia. That's crazy. 
Aaron Rodgers is the third player since at least 1950 with one or more passing touchdowns, one or more rushing touchdowns in 30 plus career games. Newton and Young are the other two. Anytime you see any kind of like scrambling plus throwing thing, uh, Newton and Young, you can pretty much bank on being some of the other guys that are in contention, especially Newton. Randall Cobb's score in the second quarter was his fifth receiving touchdown this season, which is the most since 2015. And finally, Devontae Adams has three or more receptions in 59 straight games, surpassing Chris Carter for the fifth longest streak since 1950. So he made it to fifth, and he's continuing to climb that ladder. That's crazy. Finally, I want to look at the uh, real quick recap by PFF. It usually gives us an insight into what they saw, a couple extra little insights in terms of uh, statistics and whatnot, and also a preview of probably what we're going to see tomorrow. Uh, It starts off saying the offensive woes continue for Matt Stafford and the L.A. Rams, who fell to Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers 36-28. Aaron Rodgers shook off his quote-unquote COVID toe and delivered key throws against the Rams' defensive backs. On third downs, Rodgers threw for 139 yards on 16 attempts, with five of his seven completions being first down conversions. His average depth of target on third down throws was 14.8, pushing it downfield against the Rams' tight underneath coverage. And again, I, I tend to think that this is on purpose. I think teams are trying to force Aaron Rodgers to throw the ball deep. I think they're basically saying, we don't think you can do it, which is a massive indictment. The good news is he's really starting to hit those. I was getting upset every single time he was launching it, but his his completion percentage on those was much higher this week. Not perfect. He still missed a bunch, but that's going to happen when you're throwing it 20 yards every single time. Uh, running backs, it says the Packers run game didn't do much on early downs to alleviate pressure on their legendary quarterback. The average is 2.7 yards per carry on 19 first down rushing attempts with 94% of yards coming after contact. That's crazy. AJ Dillon handled 20 of Green Bay's 32 rushes. Wide receivers. Touchdown to check down was the formula for Green Bay in the passing game with 61% of Rodgers throws going either less than 10 yards downfield or deeper than 20 yards. 20 of those 28 targets were completed for 197 yards, 10 first downs, and two touchdowns. Devontae Adams caught eight of nine targets. We already know all that stuff. Um, They did give us a little chart here. Um, Behind the line of scrimmage throws, six targets, 7.67 yards per route run, zero to nine yards, 22 targets, um, 20 or more yards, six targets. So like they were saying, touchdown to check down. Um, We got 22 plus 6 is 28, plus 6 is 34. Uh, Only 7 throws between 10 and 19 yards. Looking at the offensive lineman, it says, Rodgers' elite pocket movement brought him time, bought him time in situations where most quarterbacks would have been affected by the pass rush. He only took two quarterback hits that a Packers lineman was responsible for. That didn't stop Los Angeles from trying to get after him with 20 pressures spread across five linemen. Yash Nyman gave up both quarterback hits. So 20 pressures is relatively high. It's not super crazy. I've seen the Packers up in the 30s before, um, but I've also seen numbers as low as like 12. So it's 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 kind of high. But again, all things considered, the amount of opportunities they had with the long drives and the, and the, the time of possession and all that stuff, um, the offensive line woes and the quality of their defensive line, it could have certainly been a lot worse. Looking at the defensive line, it says Kenny Clark, Rashawn Gary, and Preston Smith are core pieces of the enormous defensive front in Green Bay. Clark had two tackles for a loss against the run. See, I thought it said one, so that must be different. Two tackles for a loss against the run and a sack as a pass rusher while Gary secured a sack for his own four pressures. Devondre Campbell, it says, has emerged as the best second-level defender for Green Bay but did not get any run stops against Los Angeles. The players he was covering caught one pass on two targets, and he only added into the pass rush once. Can't tell if they're giving a compliment or not. It sounds like it. A backhanded one, maybe. Secondary, it says Eric Stokes came into the season as a raw athletic rookie from the University of Georgia, but has carved out a role as a legitimate number two cornerback in this system. The loss of Jair Alexander has not hurt his performance, as Stokes allowed just three catches on 10 targets for 20 yards. Wow. His passer rating allowed just 39.6, meaning Stafford was just as productive attacking Stokes as he would have been throwing the ball into the third row. Eric Stokes snaps, 41 coverage snaps, 10 coverage targets, uh, 49 yards allowed, first down, touchdown rate allowed, 0%. Didn't allow a single first down or touchdown. So that's all pretty positive. (laughs) And again, I mean, what did we lose? Detroit, uh, Chicago did win, but barely. They barely beat Detroit by two points. Dallas lost. 
New Orleans lost to Buffalo. Tampa Bay won, but barely. Carolina lost, if they were ever going to be a threat. Philadelphia, who I said might potentially be a threat, they lost. The Rams obviously lost. The Vikings lost. San Francisco won, but it was necessary to get Minnesota knocked off. I mean, what, what is the worst thing that happened this week? Tampa Bay won, that's it. And barely. And again, against a 500 caliber team. So this was just a fantastic week. There's really no other way, no other way to put it. Next week, we've got a bye, but Thursday, we've got Dallas against the Saints. So either way, we get an NFC team that loses. Either the Saints beat Dallas, and Dallas is just in a complete and utter chaotic slide, or Dallas essentially eliminates the Saints from contention. They fall to 5-7. and seven. You got the Vikings and Detroit, which, I mean, okay, that's going to be a gimme for the Vikings, whoop de doo That'll bring them to 6-6. Six and six. Detroit will probably fall to 0-11-1, although we'll see. Nothing to lose and everything to gain. Uh, Arizona and the Bears, beautiful game. Now, we need the Bears to win. We need to be rooting for the Bears. I know some of you can't do it. I respect it. I understand it. But here's the thing. It's in Chicago. Pray for freezing cold, snowy weather. Um, If the Bears pull that off, the Cardinals fall. That's a great thing for us. If the Cardinals win, again, they pretty much just buried Chicago. They're done. Four and eight, they're done for the season. They're pretty much done anyways, but let's make it fun. Uh, Buccaneers and Falcons, again, the Buccaneers have a a cakewalk schedule the rest of the season, so they're just going to tiptoe their way into the playoffs. Um, Whatever, there's nothing we can really do about that. But who knows, maybe you get a fluke in there somewhere. The Rams get a gimme against the Jaguars. 49er Seahawks is beautiful because, I mean, the Seahawks are pretty, the Seahawks are three and seven. Wow. I wonder when the last time they were this bad. Had to have been a long time ago. I would say it's kind of win-win, but the Seahawks are so bad. I just need we need the Seahawks to win desperately in that game. Um, that's about it. And and again, all you got to do is kick back and just watch it. If if the team wins, fine. I, again, keep this in mind, and I've said this a bunch of times. The default for good teams, for playoff teams, is a win. That's that's the default. If the Cowboys fall to the Saints, if the Vikings fall to the Lions, if the Cardinals fall to the Bears, if the Buccaneers fall to the Falcons, if the Rams lose to the Jaguars. If the 49ers fall to the Seahawks, that's a fluke. That's not supposed to happen. These are supposed to be wins for these teams. When they look at their schedule, they say, okay, that's a win. I'm worried about that one over there, but this one, this is a win. If you don't win, and you know some of these are going to be fluke things. There's no way Dallas and Minnesota and um, Arizona and Tampa and LA and San Francisco, they're all going to win something's going to happen. And all we got to do is kick back and just wait for it. Just wait for it. It'll happen. Anyways, folks, I got to get going to Betty Town. I started watching Monk. Thanks to Blaine letting me know that Voodoo had it on sale for 40 bucks the entire Monk, all the seasons and everything. So I bought myself a birthday present and, and got Monk. And I've been binge watching Monk, which by the way, if you have not watched Monk, um, I completely understand why you would think that show's stupid. Completely under... There's something about the way that it is. The style of it, the music, the commercials. It feels like a really bad show. It's a good show. Yeah, it's a little cheesy, a little corny, a little hard to kind of get over the... uh, how unrealistic it is. You know, murders happen around them every second. You know, they went on vacation and there was a murder. (laughs) You know, like, come on. But Tony Shalhoub makes that whole show. I think if they casted just about anybody else in that role, it's a bad move. It's a bad show. He is so unbelievably good in that show. So unbelievably good. It's hilarious. If you don't know, he's he's basically a germaphobe, and that is 99% of the humor in this in this show is that he's just a freak about germ. And he is completely and totally OCD, ADD, <laughs> He walks into a crime scene, and obviously the room is just torn to shreds. And he walks in, and he's just he's just freaking out because it's so disorderly. So as he's walking the room trying to figure out what's happening, and, and because he's so OCD, he sees everything because he notices everything that's out of place. So he's brilliant for this. But as he's walking through, he's like trying to straighten up. And they're like, dude, it's a, it's a crime scene. You can't do that. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. And then he'll grab a lamp and just stand it up because he just cannot focus because it's... It's a funny show. Just go watch it. Anyways, I'm going to bed. I'm going to go watch some Monk. You have a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.